Time is perhaps the most basic and familiar feature of our experience of the world, and yet one of the most puzzling. It is basic and familiar because all our experiences, no matter what they are, say a cup of steaming coffee, a radiant smile or a surge of pain, have certain temporal characteristics. They appear to have a duration, to occur earlier than some things, be simultaneous with others, and later than the rest. The world also appears to be tensed, in the sense that at any given time, we experience something as happening now, that once was not happening, and that will cease to happen. Indeed, we know that it will be followed, in the future, by some other happening that has not yet come to pass, and that will almost immediately cease to happen. The things that haven't happened yet we think of as being future. Things that are happening now we perceive as present, and those that have happened but no longer are we think of as being in the past. For the most part, we relate to time with ease. Of course, we are sometimes frustrated by having too little or too much, or about the way events seem to organise themselves in time. But that frustration has little to do with our difficulty to understand the very nature of time. These are just the practical problems of everyday life. We live and orientate ourselves in time without having to think too much about what time is really like. And yet time has been a source of great puzzlement throughout the documented history of human intellectual life. Already in the 4th century, St. Augustine famously exclaimed with exasperation, What then is time? If no one asks me, I know what it is. If I wish to explain it to him who asks, I do not know. The puzzlement has, to a great extent, revolved around the connection between time and existence. Even though for theologians like St. Augustine and religiously minded philosophers like Spinoza, the connection to an eternal and immutable God is also of great interest. However, in contemporary metaphysical debates, the focus is very much on time and existence, and this will be our focus in this feature. Philosophical ideas about the connection between time and existence have varied over the course of history. For Aristotle, time was intimately connected to concretely existing things since, in his view, time was the measure of change in things. For him, there could be no time without change in things. For Isaac Newton, however, almost two millennia later, time was independent and separate from concretely existing things. He described time as absolute, true and mathematical, and one which, of itself and from its own nature, flows equably without relation to anything external. He admitted the possibility of a time that flowed regardless of whether anything changed. Today, with the advent of Einstein's general theory of relativity, time is again intimately connected both with space and the material bodies that curve the fabric of space-time. There is a more down-to-earth way to illustrate the puzzle about the connection between time and existence that requires no theoretical knowledge of physics and space-time. For most people today, the assumption is that time, just like space, is different from the physical things that inhabit space and time. It is the concrete stuff we can pick up and handle in various ways that we primarily think of as being existent and real. Time and space are instead popularly thought of as immaterial dimensions in which material things exist and in which they can move. Still, while it is easy to imagine space as a great expanse in which planets and stars are spread out and in which they move from one place to another, the sense in which things are distributed across time and how they move about in time is far from straightforward. A popular idea is that while concrete material things are distributed in space, 
they are not really distributed in time. They are all stuck in the present. You are here now, but you are not in the future or the past. Indeed, in this view, nothing is literally in the future or in the past. Everything is suspended permanently in the present. If anything recedes into the past, it is the event of our death or the event of a glass breaking. The fragments of glass still remain on the floor as the event of its breaking recedes into the past. Here we have a puzzle about the relationship between events and existence. The existence of material things is relatively easy to understand. They are concrete, solid objects we can handle and manipulate. Events, on the other hand, are intuitively understood as changes that happen to concrete, solid things or somehow involve them. The event of a corner kick in football consists of the player kicking the ball to make it fly across the goal in the hope of someone heading it into the goal. How can such an event involving concrete things existing permanently in the present be at once in the future then be manifested in the present by the physical activity of the players and ball on the pitch and then recede away into the past while the ball, players and pitch remain in the present. In contemporary philosophy, two opposing views dominate the debate about this puzzle. According to what is called presentism, the only things and events that exist at all are those that exist presently. The corner kick never exists in the future, nothing does, but comes into existence as the player kicks the ball and goes out of existence as soon as the activity of the players and ball turn into some activity other than a corner kick. According to this view, nothing is ever in the future. In fact, properly speaking, there is no future. What we call the future, in this view, is just our anticipation about the activities that the presently existing things are about to embark on next. What we call the past, in turn, is just our memory of what has happened before, but is no longer happening. There is no future or past, but the present changes to give rise to a qualitatively different present. Nevertheless, we can easily represent the anticipated events as well as the presently occurring events and the events we remember as standing in linear order from future to past. In our imagination, that succession of events can be thought of as being spread out in time, as if it was a space-like expanse, a fourth dimension. But, according to presentism, there really is no such dimension. It is all in our heads. The contrary opposite view is called eternalism, according to which concrete material entities are not really confined to the present. Indeed, they do not even pass from moment to moment in any sense that we intuitively think of them as doing. Instead, each material object is conceived of as a sum of consecutive temporal parts each part existing at each particular time, and no part passing from future to present and into the past. In this view, there really is no objectively privileged present where things exist and events happen. Instead, all times are equally existent and real. Eternalism explains that things and events only appear to be confined to the present because of the limited perspective of human observers. Our experience of everything being confined to the present is thus illusory to a certain extent. The sense in which eternalism claims that things really exist at many times without passing from one time to another while they appear to move from one to the other is often explained using an analogy. We are urged to think of objects not as passing through time but as extending through time, like a salami or a worm, of which only a momentary slice is visible at any given time. 
A subject experiencing a succession of different slices of the salami, while never seeing the salami as a whole, will mistakenly infer that the slice is moving through time and changing in shape and texture. Presentism is often claimed to be a closer fit to the way people ordinarily think of time and existence in time. And yet, eternalism is perhaps more widely adopted in the philosophical community. Why would that be? One argument is that presentism relies heavily on the idea of an absolute present, and that this is incompatible with the relativity of simultaneity according to the theory of relativity. Another argument is that physics fails to give any priority to the present above the future and past. Both arguments are a matter of controversy. Purely philosophical arguments, such as McTaggart's paradox and the problem of temporary intrinsics, which are meant to prove that tense and change over time is contradictory, have also contributed to the idea that tense must be a merely subjective feature of our experience. They too are highly controversial arguments that would each require a treatment of their own. Eternalism, on the other hand, is accused of offering a static and unchanging image of reality, in that it depicts the history of the universe not as a development of material entities that change and move around in space, but as a static and unchanging whole of material particles that each exist permanently at a given space-time point. This is what is known as the block universe. Since each particle may have different properties, then an observer observing each segment of the block in succession may get the impression of change. But this is only an illusion. However, this begs the question as to how an observer existing in the block and who is also made up of temporal parts, each existing at a given time and each part having a fixed mental content, can have a continuous experience of passing through the block. While presentism is seen as problematic with respect to the manifest image of the world of physics, eternalism is seen as unable to explain how our experience of a dynamic reality can arise at all, and very definitely renders that experience as largely illusory. There are alternative and intermediary positions to presentism and eternalism. Positions that bear such fascinating names as the moving spotlight theory and the growing block. But they too give rise to similar problems concerning the connection between time and existence. The philosophical debate continues about the viability of all the views mentioned here.